I hope this finds you doing well, and uh, I don't think I have any announcements for you today other than we continue to worship at 8 a.m. outside in front of the Honeywell Church, 9.30 a.m. a half hour earlier in the parking lot of the Shelbina Methodist Church, and uh, we it's going really well. So uh, the... For worship today, we are continuing to look at the Lord's Prayer, which according to the Gospel of Matthew, this is what we, we read, that when the disciples ask, how shall we pray, that Jesus tells them, pray like this, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. The disciples ask Jesus, teach us how to pray. And Jesus begins to teach them words that we have worn smooth, knowing them so well that once we begin, the rest just begins to flow. Our Father, right? We, we know how that goes. That, that's where we began last week, with our Father. And now we continue. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Beginning with talking to our Father, there's a temptation to think that we're talking to our Heavenly Father, who is just like our Father here, right? We all have a dad, or just, just talking to another type of dad. And, uh, and we know our dad, and there's a, there's a sense, all, I'm sure that many people have had the, the experience of looking in the mirror and realizing you're starting to look a lot like your parents. And so there's a, a familiarity with, with your father, your, your dad. And so beginning uh, with saying our Father helps us to know that we are praying as a family, our, our Father collectively, we're in this together as a family. But then the next words make it clear that this family is not like any other family that is. For our Father is not just like any dad, it's our Father who is in heaven. Our Father in Heaven makes it clear that this is a Father on a different scale than uh, all of our fathers here. Right? Our Father is far larger than any other person, is not bound by our expectations or understanding. Right? And that's profoundly good to know and to remember, I believe, for what we are praying for... What we're asking when we start getting into the petitions that we bring to our Father later in this prayer, we realize that we're asking for things that are vast, that are big. We are praying for our daily bread for each of us. We're praying for God's kingdom. We're praying for forgiveness and reconciliation to break out between all people. We pray for people who are sick with overwhelming diseases. We are praying for broken families and broken marriages. We are praying for people we love that struggle with horrible burdens. When we go to our Father in prayer, we are often bringing to our Father things that, that are vast and challenging and, and seem to be beyond our control. And to bring uh, these prayer concerns to someone who is just like a dad, you know, just call your dad, right? We, we want to be able to bring our, our concerns to someone who is not just our Father, but our Father in heaven. This is what, uh, what, what Paul gets at when Paul tells the church at Ephesus, it's in Ephesians 6, he says, Our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, we take up the whole armor of God so that we might be able to withstand evil and stand firm. Right, to stand firm, it can be a bit of a challenge, right? And, and to be able to pray to a Heavenly Father who can act on this cosmic level is essential, especially in uh, these challenging times. And I gotta say, that is the most hackneyed phrase. I, I hear that phrase multiple times a day now when I listen to the news. In these challenging times. But that is the truth, right? That, that's the situation uh, that we're in. We're living through uh, 2020, and with all the things going on in 2020, you know what they are, I know what they are, right? With all the things going on, we're not praying to just our dad. We're praying to our heavenly father, to our father who art in heaven. We're talking to the big guy, right? We're talking to our father in heaven, and that father is bigger and greater and grander than we can imagine. 
right? To say that our Heavenly Father is, uh, our, our Father who is in heaven, like, I don't know where heaven is. I don't understand it. I don't conceive of it. I can't perceive of it. I can't perceive it. But what we are doing is we're praying to a Father who is in heaven, who is in this world, but not of this world, who is in this world and more than this world. Our Heavenly Father who creates and sustains and is active in this world. But, but it's just more than. And that we grapple with cosmic powers who, who are at equal to any force, any equal to any power that is of this world. You know, it is just very reassuring to know that we pray to a Father who is in heaven, a Father who is greater, a Father who is bigger than anything else. Right? And so of this pr Father we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. I think it's essential to notice that this is the passive tense, right? It is not saying that Jesus isn't teaching us our, to, to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, we will make your name holy. That's not the prayer. It's not that we will make God's name holy. We, we can't, right? We cannot make God's name holy. God will do that with or, or without our help, right? The prayer is not that we change who God is. It's, it's that... Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God is the one who is making God's name holy. And so let's take a moment to figure out what this phrase means. Right? What, is, what does it mean to talk about God's name? To talk about God's name, you know, if you think about what we, how we use our name. What is the thing you do most with your name? Right? The thing you do most with your name, I'd be willing to bet, is sign credit card receipts. Right, that, that's what we do. We sign a lot of credit card receipts when we're out and about, or sign checks, right? And to put, take our name and to put it onto paper is to commit ourselves. Right? I, I have committed. I am good for this. I personally, myself, my being, I will back this up. I have put my name to it. Right? If you think of, the, think of all the things you have done by putting your name down, and the way that you have changed who you are, right? If, by, by signing your name, and, and then something changes. You, you go from not owning a house to owning a house, from not owing money to owing money, to, to being, not being married to being married. Like you, you change who you are by using your name, right? And there, so there's a sense in which to talk about your name is to talk about yourself. And, and how we pe treat people, all right, is wrapped up in their name. Right, if you want to really mess with somebody, you defame them, you slander them, you tell lies about them, you, you insult their name, right? you, you cast aspersion on their name, you question their, their name, you attack, that, that's, that's what it hurts the worst. I mean, you can bruise someone, bruise his heel, but if you cause other people to doubt their name, doubt their honor, doubt their integrity, that, that is, we, we have these words, defamation and slander, to talk about this. And so, in Scripture, there is this sense that the name of a person has this, this weight, right? This, this value to it that, it that is even more than we have today, right? To, to change a person when... Um, Jacob wrestles with an angel uh, going back to see his brother after he's been in exile. He's been away for, for years, and, and he, are, he wrestles with God, and he, it, it, it changes him. And, and Jacob's name is changed to Israel. Israel means struggles. El means God. And so he walks away with a limp. He's been changed by, this, by the changing of his name. And, and so and, um, it, when the temple is built in Jerusalem, the way that God makes the temple holy, is, is he says, I will place my name in the temple. And that, that's what fills the temple with God's presence. It's God's name being there. And so to make God's name, to make God's self holy, well, what does it mean to be holy? That's kind of like asking, what, is it, what makes Andy holy? Andy. Like, what is the essential nature of Andy? What makes me who I am? I don't really know I can answer that question, but that's the type of question that, that what we're looking at here. What makes God holy is what makes God God? It's the same question. The essential nature of God is that God is holy. God is other. God is greater than. God, God is 
vaster than we can understand. Right? What makes God God is that God is holy. That is essential to the very nature of, of, of who God is. And so to pray, hallowed be thy name, is not, is, is not something that we do. It's not something that we change. It's saying that God is going to be holy. God's very self, God's name, God's being is going to be holy because that's what it means to be God. And, and it's a passive tense, right? We're not doing it. God's doing it. God, keep on being God. And may we please be involved in what you're up to. That's kind of the sense of it, right? Hallowed be thy name is to say that you are going to continue to be holy. You're going to continue to be different. And you're so good, God, can we jump in and allow us to join you in you doing what you're going to do anyways. There, there's a document called the Westminster Shorter Catechism that has been used for 350 years to teach uh, children what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to be Christian. And it's set up as a series of questions and answers. And the very first question, this is, you may have heard this, right? The very first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism is, what is the chief end of man? Like, what is the chief goal of humanity? Right? The chief end of man Man's chief end is to glorify God and to, and to enjoy God forever. I, God, humanity's chief goal is to glorify God and to enjoy this. To glorify God, to join in with what God is always, already doing, to, to hollow God's name as we're saying the Lord's Prayer. This is all connected. It's all the same thing. Right? And, and joining in and hollowing God's name and being able to pray, God, you're going to continue to be God. Let us jump in on this. What we find is that holiness rubs off. That holiness rubs off. And so when Paul writes to the early churches, he addresses them as holy ones. Right? The, the, the word he uses, hagias, it means holy ones, because they have, they're worshiping God, they're joining in in the hallowing of God's name, and, and it's rubbing off, and they're becoming holy ones. And so the word hagias, which literally means holy ones, we now translate as saints. Right? The saints are the holy ones, the ones who have been part of hallowing God's name as, as proclaiming God as holy, as being part of praying this prayer that directs us to our Heavenly Father. And in doing this as a way of life, it has rubbed off. And so that you look at someone and say, ah, there's something to them, something more, something greater, something that is of heaven. And if that starts to sound like worship, the hallowing of God's name, well... That's exactly what it is. In worship, we gather and we pray that our Father who makes us family, right? We pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. We pray our Father who makes us family, who brings us together. Our Father who is greater than any powers or principalities. Our Father in heaven who is bigger than any problem we can ever, occur, ever uh, run into, any problem we can ever encounter. Our Father in heaven, may we join you in what you're already doing. May we join in, in, in with you being holy. Can we join with you being God and doing what you care about so passionately? Knowing that in doing so, we become part of what you're doing. Knowing that in doing so, that holiness rubs off and we become a bit more like you. Right? And the order here matters because this is what we've prayed thus far. Like our Father, you make us family. You, you be, we become family. Our Father in heaven, who is far greater than anything we're doing and uh, any problem we face. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We're jumping in. We are invited to be part of what you're doing and you, God being God. And what comes next is thy kingdom come. And it's important to get it in that order so that it's clear that this is about what God's doing. Right? Thy kingdom come is not something that we're doing. It doesn't depend upon us. And that's a temptation to think that if we don't do it and we don't get it right, that we're gonna, it's not going to happen. And my friends, it is going to happen. Because it's God's kingdom. And God is not going to cease to be God. God's going to continue to be God. God is making God's name holy. Because that's the nature of who God is. And we are then welcomed into what God is already doing. We can be part of the worship of making God's name holy. And as part of then God's family, we are welcomed to be part of what God is already going to do. 
that thy kingdom is going to come. And that ends up being where we land, right? The Westminster Catechism tells us that the chief goal of humanity is to glorify God, to worship, and then to enjoy God forever. Right, this is a good place to land because it lands with joy. In drawing close to our Heavenly Father, in knowing that God is going to be God and that we are invited to be part of God's family, in part, uh, to live that life together is to be rooted in a joy, a deep-seated joy that sustains us this day and always because we are part of our Heavenly Father's family and God's going to be God. And that's a beautiful thing to say, and it's a beautiful thing to confess. It is what can sustain us in these, as they keep on saying, in these challenging times. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for reaching out to us. Thank you for inviting us to, into what you are doing, for welcoming, welcoming us into a family, a way to, to be drawn closer to all that is holy, that is good. We give you thanks for such hope, for in times when life is confusing, when there is much that is beyond us, and we don't see an end in sight to these challenges we face, we are thankful that you draw us closer together, you draw us closer to you, knowing that in doing so we are caught up in your desires, your hopes, your plans, and your future. And so we pray this day for those who are unheard, we pray for those who are risking their lives in service to a community, we pray for those who are protesting in service to their community. We, we pray for those who are wearing a uniform in service to their community. We pray that both might seek to serve in peaceful ways, that, such that nonviolence becomes a given and reconciliation be what all people seek. We pray for those who continue to serve in the midst of this pandemic, as we watch numbers rise across the country, as we watch businesses open. We pray for wisdom and for patience that we might do what is needed to love and serve our neighbors. We pray for those who we name before you, those who are sick, those who are still at home and, and struggling with being at home for such a long time. And we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Go us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of Jesus Christ be with you this day and always.